Usually we take this opportunity to pray for another church right here in our city. Uh, this is one of the ways that we live out Jesus's prayer uh, that we would be one is by praying for other churches right here in our city. But today we're gonna depart from that uh, because we have a special guest here with us that I want you to meet. And uh, his name is Pastor Oscar uh, Calderon. He pastors a church in Bogota, Colombia. And we wanna pray for their church and their ministry down there. So uh, Pastor Oscar, would you guys come on up, Angelica and your family, Come on up and uh, we just want to pray for you guys. Can you guys greet them as they come? So we're so excited for you to get to meet these guys. Uh, Pastor Oscar uh, oversees a church in Bogota, Colombia, a very influential church. But in addition to that, they bring in pastors from around the area to mentor, to train, to impart. So many of these guys end up in ministry and pastoring churches and haven't had access to adequate training and formation. And so Pastor Oscar spends quite a bit of time doing that. Uh, they're here visiting this week and I just wanted them to have a chance to greet you and for us to have a chance to greet them and pray over them. So Pastor Oscar, would you share? Thank you, Pastor. Iglesia, buenos dias. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Gracias. Reciban un saludo muy especial de nuestra iglesia en Bogotá, Colombia. I would like to greet you from our church in Bogotá, Colombia. Gracias por tomar tiempo y orar por nosotros. Thank you so much for taking time to pray for us. En verdad que siempre necesitamos de sus oraciones. It is true that we need of your prayers. El apóstol Pablo dijo que somos un solo cuerpo. The Apostle Paul said we are a, one body. Amen. That's right. Y como un solo cuerpo necesitamos contarle al mundo entero que solo en Jesucristo hay esperanza. And as one body we need to tell the whole world that in Christ there is yes, hope. That's right. That's right. Juan el Bautista fue una voz que gritó en el desierto. John the Baptist was was a voice that was preaching from the desert. Yes. Y alguien dijo que Juan el Bautista vació las ciudades y llenó el desierto. Somebody said that John the Baptist emptied the cities but filled up the deserts. Mm. Y juntos necesitamos vaciar las ciudades y llenar las iglesias. And together we need to empty the cities and fill up the church. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Así que esta iglesia se va a llenar el domingo pastor. So the church, the church will be filled. <laughs> amen, amen. Necesitamos contar del gran amor de Cristo. We need to tell the people about the great love of Christ. Mil gracias por eh, esta oportunidad, por este tiempo. Yo voy a clamar al Señor para que lo que ustedes nos deseen, Dios se lo multiplique diez veces más. I thank you for taking the, the time to pray for us and I am praying to the Lord that He will repay you ten times full what you are desiring for us. Y quiero presentarles a mi esposa. Ustedes saben que las mujeres son muy importantes en nuestro ministerio. I want to introduce you to my wife. You know that women are very important in our ministry. Amen. Thank you. And I, we're going to pray for them, but I have to point out what a great voice he has. I, I, I kept wanting to hear him say Telemundo. You know, it, it sounded like that broadcaster. Of, didn't it sound like that? The, I need a voice like that, you know. Uh, but I want us to pray for them. You know, we hear a lot about in the news of things that happen in Colombia. You hear a lot about the cartel and things like that. And then you've got people like this that are taking a stand and oftentimes at great risk. There's a lot of threat and things like that that they have to just over, overcome. And so he's not only doing that with his church, he's ask, actually raising up and mentoring other churches. Specifically, we wanna pray uh, for the Joshua Ministry. And this is the church outreach mentoring new and small church pastors and their leaders. And so we wanna pray over them as they go and do that. Uh, they're not gonna be able to stick around uh, after the first service, they were out in the missions corner, got to meet some folks. If you want more information about their ministry or their church, you can let us know. We'll send that information out. We'll post something on social media later so you can get into contact with them if you'd like to. But would you join me now and let's pray for them. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. 
Thank you, Father. God, we thank you for your goodness. I thank you for Pastor Oscar. I thank you for his willingness to take a stand, for his willingness to do his part to advance your kingdom. God, I thank you for their ministry there in Columbia. God, I thank you specifically for the Joshua ministry. And we pray for favor for them, Father, as these pastors come in, these small churches and new church plants. God, that you would use Pastor Oscar and his team to mentor, to train, to equip these pastors to go out and advance your kingdom in that area. And God, we thank you for the, how your word tells us where darkness abounds grace abounds much more. And we thank you for your grace being poured out on them and through them in Bogota, Colombia and the surrounding area, Father. We, even as we're gathered around them right now, we pray that your favor would surround them, that your protection would surround them, that no weapon formed against them would prosper, but everything they do in your name will. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Give them a hand, you guys. Thank you so much. Bless you guys. Absolutely. Thank you. You can just take that down there. Awesome. Well, just a couple of other announcements, and then we're going to also pray over any graduates that might be here. Uh, this is the beginning of VBS this week, in case you didn't notice that on the way in. Uh, this is what all this is about, and uh, it's pretty amazing as you go out there. And if you didn't come in through the main lobby, I want to encourage you to go out that way and just see what our team of volunteers have done. And I want to say, just first off, that I am so proud of you guys, the team and volunteers that have already worked to get this ready. Uh, they've been up here all week. They were up here until 8 o'clock last night setting things up. You guys, I'm really proud of you. You work so hard, and I know you do it as unto the Lord. But let me say thank you. For all of you that will be volunteering through the week, I want to go ahead and say thank you in advance. It's going to be an amazing week. I can't wait to hear the stories, but thank you so much. Uh, we had to close our registration because we're at 500 kids, 500 children. I mean, that's a lot of kids all week here, plus all the volunteers. And so we actually need some uh, volunteers still because we had some registrations come in last minute, even after we closed registration. We opened it because to take care of a clerical uh, uh, administrative need, and when we did, more rushed in. And we're like, oh, wait. And so there is a waiting list. If you didn't register, you can get on that waiting list in case there's any cancellations until 1 p.m. You can register. Uh, also, if you want to volunteer, you can let us know that. You can talk to one of the people in the child check-in area and let us know if you're interested in being here this week and volunteer. We could certainly use your help. Now, we want to pray over any graduates. This is a huge season of transition. If you've graduated from high school, graduated from college, or any other kind of graduation, would you just stand and let us acknowledge you for just a moment? Just stand if you're graduating. Okay, got a couple over here, a couple over here. Just stay, remain standing. So just remain standing for a minute. Congratulations to you and congratulations to your families because we know it's uh, a lot of involvement there that, to get to that moment, but you've worked very hard. And we just wanna pray for you as you transition into a new season in your life. So would you guys just join me and let's pray for these graduates. Heavenly Father, we lift all, all the, these, these graduates up to you. And Lord, we know that transitions can be difficult and intimidating and uh, a little bit, in, and we can be overcome with anxiety or worry about those things. We just speak peace over these graduates as they move into a new season in their lives, as they transition into college or transition into a job or wherever they're moving into in this season of transition. We pray that you would be with them, that you would give them hope and courage and faith. God, that you would make the next steps clear to them as they make this transition. And we bless them in Jesus' name. We pray, God, you would lead them to the right relationships, protect them from relationships that would be destructive or would bring them off track. And we pray that you would lead them to the right friendships, the right relationships, that you would give them favor and you would prosper them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's give them a hand. Thank you, guys. You can be seated. <clears throat> Prayer matters. Would you guys stand with me for the reading of the word today? I'm going to be reading to you from Deuteronomy chapter 6. Verses four through nine. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. 
What we're talking about today is passing our faith on to the next generation. And in this passage that we just read in Deuteronomy, God is speaking to the whole community, to all of Israel. This is what you're to do. To the whole community, pass your faith on to the next generation. How are you gonna do that? You're gonna talk about it. You're gonna talk about it when you're with them, when you walk along the road, when you lie down at night, when you take your meals, when you rise in the morning. It's our responsibility to pass our faith on to the next generation. All of us, not just those who happen to be parents, all of us as adult believers, all of us as followers of Jesus are called to pass our faith on to the next generation. This generation has been called a fatherless generation. Next Sunday is Father's Day and we're gonna honor dads. We're gonna have a donut wall and some other things out there. It's gonna be great. But this generation has been called a fatherless generation. Maybe you've heard that. Here are some statistics that I wanna share with you that might be a little bit uncomfortable for a Sunday morning, but we have to be willing to talk about these things. 63% of all youth suicides are from fatherless homes. 90% of all homeless and runaways are from fatherless homes. 85% of children who show behavior disorders come from fatherless homes. 80% of all rapists come from fatherless homes. These are alarming statistics. 71% of high school dropouts come from fatherless homes. What do we do about that? Because we can't be everybody's father, we can't be their, their dad, but this is the reality that is facing our culture right now. And it affects everybody. This isn't just about dads, it's about how, how that affects moms, how it affects all of us, right? How it affects our, our, our culture. So what do we do about that? Josh McDowell, many of you have heard of Josh McDowell, uh, the great thinker and leader, and he's done a lot of evangelism among college students and youth throughout the years. He wrote books uh, like Evidence That Demands a Verdict, Josh McDowell, even in his later years, was still speaking to large assemblies and arenas of college students and young people. He had such a heart for young people, even as an older man. His message changed some, and his delivery changed some. Now he was more like the grandfather speaking to the next generation, and they wanted to hear him. They were around listening to him. And you know, when you're speaking to a group, you begin to develop a rapport with a group. And he's speaking to this large gathering of college students and he's feeling the love and he's feeling the connection and he has so much genuine, authentic love for them. He's saying, man, I love you guys. I wish I could take you all home with me. I wish, I wish that I could do that. And as he's preparing to leave the stage, somebody at about 30 rows back stands up and says, will you be my dad? Pin drop. He stopped. He turned around and another one popped up. Will you be my dad? A girl back here in tears stands up crying. Will you be my dad? It kept happening over and over again. It's a generation that's crying out for this. This is what's going on in the world around us. This is why we, as a church, our Redeemer Church, is intentional and dedicated to reaching the next generation and why we are intentionally generational. We know the statistics. 80% of all the people that become followers of God by putting their faith in Jesus make that decision before they're 18. Yet 80% or more of church budgets are focused on people over the age of 18. That's out of balance. We've gotta make a difference. We've gotta do something different. It's why we have such a commitment to youth. It's why we have such a commitment to kids. It's why we put so much emphasis on Vacation Bible School this week. This is up to us. So what can we do about it? There are 74 million people under the age of 19 in the United States. That's a lot, so what can we do? We can't necessarily be their dad, but we can be another voice. We can't be their father, but we can step into that space and fill that gap as their community of faith. This is what happened in my life. People that stepped into that space, spoke into my life, 
and filled that gap. It's why as soon as I felt a call to ministry and I was pursuing God and I'm thinking, if God is knowable and if God is real and knowable, what could be more important in my life than knowing God? God, I wanna know you. I wanna be as close to you as I possibly can. And as I began pursuing that, the thing that was burning inside of me was a heart for all the young people that were aimless and purposeless and just like this, fatherless. It's what burned in me to reach young people. And it's why when we started Youthquake, one of our commitments was that we just wanna be another voice to step into that space. Because listen, if we don't, someone else will. If we don't step into that space, someone will. It will just be the wrong someone. I wanna show you something that I haven't done on a Sunday morning before. I've shown this in other settings and parent fundraisers and some of the youth events. I'm gonna show you a clip from an animated feature called Treasure Planet. It's a, it's a video montage, and you'll hear, if you listen to the lyrics, you'll hear the heart of a generation. If you watch the imagery, you'll see what's so important. Now, in the story, this movie Treasure Planet is basically a modern retelling of Treasure Island. And Treasure Island, Long John Silver, befriends this young boy. And it looks like it's such a wonderful thing, but he ends up betraying him. And this is what will happen to a generation if we don't step into that space, someone will. It'll likely be a pirate that looks really good on the surface, but is not the influence that they actually need. So I'm gonna show you this. I hope it, I hope it goes over well. <laughs> but, I, but I believe in it. And I, I believe we as a church need to embrace this, all of us. Every, every, every adult it's our responsibility to pass our faith on. Watch this, watch this clip. <laughs> Put some elbow into it. I am a question to the world, not an answer to
We have a generation that's got a gap. We are a community of faith. We can fill that gap. We've gotta be that other voice. We've gotta step in that place because if we do not, someone will. But it might be a pirate that does not have their best interest in mind and leads them astray. This is why we are intentionally generational. It's why we're dedicated to reaching the next generation. And this is all of us. This is every one of us in this church that are a part of this community in some way. It's our responsibility to do this, to pass our faith on. As adult believers, we have that responsibility and it's an incredible honor. They don't have to be fatherless if we pass our faith on that leads them to God the Father. So how can we do this? What is it gonna take for us to do this? I wanna share with you uh, real quick four, four keys. You can apply this personally in your own context and certainly we apply it as a church. These are things that are important here for us. First is this, to pass our faith on to the next generation, we need to know them and we need to really believe in them. We need to believe in their potential and speak to their potential. I mean, really believe in it. And not, not, you know, so many adults, when they talk about the next generation, they do it in a critical way. What we need to do is believe in them. We need to see the potential in them, believe in it, and speak to it. If we do, they will leave everything and they will follow Jesus. This is what happened in Luke chapter five when Jesus is preaching and Peter and his companions have been fishing all night and they didn't catch anything. And Jesus is now in his boat. Peter's been fishing all night, no fish, frustrated, cleaning his nets to go home and take a nap. And now there's a preacher in his boat preaching and he's stuck there. You ever been stuck in a meeting you didn't wanna be in? Don't raise your hand right now. And he's listening, right? And then Jesus tells him to, Drop his, to put the boats out in deep water and drop the nets. It's a great passage, and there's so many in this and what it reveals about who Jesus is. But Peter does it. He drops the nets, and he starts catching so much fish. The other partners see it. They come out. They start catching so much fish that the boats are sinking. Everybody's caught up in this moment. Fish coming in, pulling in the nets, laughing, probably high-fiving. You know, and all of a sudden, Peter realizes what's happened. He goes over. And he falls down on his knees in front of Jesus. And he says, go away from me. I'm a sinful, I'm a sinful man. What Jesus does in that moment is what we must do for the next generation. Jesus looks beyond what he sees on the surface, that Peter is an uneducated fisherman. He looks beyond the fact that he's been fishing all night. He's probably dirty and smelling and frustrated. He looks past all that. And he says, Peter, no. Peter said, go away from me. I'm a sinful man. Jesus says, no, you're gonna be a fisher of men. Follow me. You're gonna be a fisher of men. And in that statement, there's so much that Jesus says. Peter, one day, you're gonna stand up and preach Thousands of people's lives will be changed. Peter, you're gonna write letters that will be considered holy scripture. Peter, you are gonna change the world. And Peter's response was, he left everything and he followed Jesus. This is what we need to do for the next generation. Is we need to see their potential and speak to it. And if we do, they'll leave everything and they'll follow Jesus. How do you speak to their potential? Well, first of all, you have to see it. To speak to their potential, you have to see it. Don't just speak to the behavior, which is what we're so tempted to do. Look beyond the behavior. Speak to the potential. Yes, sometimes behavior has to be corrected, but what often happens is we have a generation of adults that walk around just criticizing the next generation and, and putting down whatever they do. And that's demotivating. That's not gonna call anybody up to something. So we criticize, you know, anybody live in Nocatee? We see them driving golf carts, and you get a little frustrated. All these teenagers are really driving cars, they're not even paying attention. They got four teenagers on there, they're having the time of their life, and we're behind them, you know? And you could be tempted to say something negative instead of finding the positive. Or people see them walking around with their, their you know, like this, and they talk about it. And it's easy to criticize that. Well, well let's find the, the positives. 
Hey, they're going to be a generation that's going to know how to use technology in ways we never could. And imagine what they could do if, if God really got a hold of their life. Imagine how they could use that technology to do good things. To, I mean, there's, there's ways that we can look and find the positive instead of just speaking to the negative and criticizing. Let's see the potential and speak to it. There were a lot of things in that moment Jesus could have said about Peter that he needed to get right in his life, but he did not do that. Instead, he spoke to his potential. Jeremiah, chapter one. God calls Jeremiah to be a prophet to the nations. Scholars say that Jeremiah was between 12 and 14 years old. Jeremiah chapter one, verses four through eight, God calls him to be a prophet. He says, I can't do that, God. I'm just a kid. I'm only a youth. And God says to him, don't say to me, I'm only a youth. I will be with you. You can do this. And God encourages him. God is seeing something and speaking to something in Jeremiah that Jeremiah does not even see. This is what we've got to do for the next generation. Help them see something in themselves they might not even see. We have to see it and speak to it. And if we do, they'll follow him. Encouragement goes a lot further than correction. It makes a bigger impact. One of the reasons it makes such a big impact is because there is a shortage of encouragement in our world today. You don't want to know why teenagers and kids are always so defensive? Because they're always having to defend something. Somebody's criticizing something. Let's, let's encourage them. Watch how they respond to encouragement a lot better. And it makes such a big impact when somebody sees something about them, catches them doing something right, and speaks to it. Go out of your way to find a trait or an admirable quality that you can speak to and encourage them. We gotta believe in them and speak to that potential. The second thing is that we can do is just be consistent. Be consistent. Hebrews 13, verse eight is on the screen, but I'm gonna read verse seven to you also. It says, remember your leaders, those who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus isn't bouncing around all over the place. He isn't waking up one day in a bad mood and changes all the rules and wakes up the next day and decides, I mean, he's just not like that. He's consistent. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. What we need to be is consistent. To be, be real, be authentic, and be consistent. This is true, like, especially in parenting. You know, it's, it's frustrating for a kid when parents have rules that are inconsistent. You know, they won't let you listen to this kind of music, but it's okay if you watch all these movies with murder and violence and all this. Like, there's no consistency. And I'm not, I'm not trying to get into, like, legalism or anything like that. I'm just saying whatever it is, be consistent. Be consistent. Be consistent in, in your, your discipline. Be consistent in your devotion to God. Be consistent in going to church. Be con all these things matter. Which leads to the next one, which is to be a model. So believe in them, be consistent, be a model. Model the behavior that we wanna see. We just read in Hebrews where he says to imitate their faith. The apostle Paul says it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse one, he says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. We need to be a model of what we want them to see. This is one of the reasons why here we keep the kids in here until the end of worship. We're trying to let them be around the community as we worship together. They may not be in a place emotionally or developmentally where they can enter into that depth of relationship with God that we have, but we want them to be around it, to see it, that it's modeled to them. This is how they learn. Young people model the standard they can see. You are that standard. And again, this goes back to the being consistent. Like we come in here and we act a certain way, and then we leave and we get in the car and we're criticizing or you know, all this other stuff and it's not consistent. And then we, we're wondering why they just blow it all off. We gotta model. We're the standard that they see. We need to model the right stuff. Whatever we do in moderation, they will do in excess. So if you are disrespectful of authority, they're gonna be disrespectful of you. If you disrespect coaches and teachers and police officers and people in authority, they will disrespect you. If you disrespect the politicians you disagree with, they're gonna do that in excess. You can disagree with politicians, 
But don't be disrespectful. You can disagree with people in authority, but don't be disrespectful. Don't dishonor them. I learned this as a teenager when I was really starting to follow the Lord on my own and I was growing in my own faith, God really helped me to recognize that every time I dishonored my mom, I dishonored him. Because Romans 13 says all authority is given by God. And the way that you respond to that authority is the way you respond to God. What I had to learn to do was how do I disagree with my mom without dishonoring my mom? How do I disagree with those in authority without disrespecting those in authority? You can do it. This is what we've got to model to them. It all matters because whatever we do in moderation, they do in excess. And then the final thing is to be one. This is back to, back to unity. This isn't just about church to church, this is about how we behave as a community, that we have unity. Romans chapter 15 says, may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together, you may with one voice glorify God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God the Father. Nothing is more powerful than unity and nothing is more destructive than disunity. One of the famous church fathers, Cyprian, he said, schism is worse than heresy. Schism is a sin worse than heresy because he said schism ensures the heresy remains. Because once you break relationship, there's no opportunity for correction or growth. It's almost worse. Disunity is so destructive. Again, it doesn't mean we don't disagree, but we can still have an attitude of oneness, an attitude of unity. Unity in the spirit is powerful. We saw on the day of Pentecost when they were all together in one accord. That's when the Holy Spirit is poured out and this great revival happens. We know how powerful unity is when we gather and we pray together in unity. When we join our faith together in unity, it's powerful. We see how unity is, is powerful in a family and how disunity can be destructive in parenting, in a church. So many people look to the church and what they see is not one. It's just more division. And see, here's the thing. It's... Unity, oneness, provides security for the next generation. Unity provides security. Our kids growing up around hearing us pray for other churches and talk well about other churches, you know, one of the side effects of those kinds of things is it gives them a sense of security and it models right relationship, healthy relationship. It takes work and communication to be one. It takes work and communication to to have unity, but this is what it's gonna take if we, as a community, are gonna stand in that gap and pass our faith on to the next generation. This is not just about Vacation Bible School, but it's why we do Vacation Bible School. It's not just about reaching teenagers with our youth program, but it's why we have a youth program that reaches teenagers. It's not just about Youth Quake Live and ministries like that, but it's why we're a part of those kinds of ministries, because of this. Because it's, it's our responsibility to stand in that gap for that generation that's saying, will you be my dad? And we wanna lead them to God the Father. That's what we're called to do, amen. Would you stand with me? We're gonna pray here in just a moment, and our goal is to lead the next generation to have a close relationship with God by placing their trust in Jesus and thereby passing our faith on to the next generation. But honestly, that starts with us doing that. You can't lead where you haven't gone. You can't take somebody where you haven't gone. Leading means you go there first. So the starting place is for us to place our faith in God by trusting Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And so I'm gonna lead us in a prayer as we just respond to this. And we believe that when we encounter God through his word that we wanna have a moment to respond. So I'm gonna lead us in a prayer and then we're just gonna go back into a worship song and let the Lord just seal this in our hearts. And then we'll come to communion together in just a moment. 
But I want to lead you in a prayer of placing our faith in God by putting our trust in Jesus. Would you bow your hearts before the Lord and I'll lead you, but you pray this and you make this your prayer. Let's pray this together. Repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I confess that I have sinned against you in my thoughts, my words, and my actions. Have mercy on me and forgive me through your son, my savior. Lord Jesus, I believe you lived on this earth. You died for my sin. You rose and now live. I receive you as my Lord. Holy Spirit, fill me with power and passion to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name. Let's continue to allow the Lord to seal this moment as we worship together.